Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams. It's Friday, so it's time for another Gross Path Challenge. This one is Gross Path Challenge number 26. It is the last batch of slides from test three of the 2004 descriptive path course given in the halls of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. Let's get out our pencils, our papers, and get ready to go. Give yourself 60 to 90 seconds per question. And let's begin. Tissue number one is tissue from a horse. I would like the location and I would like the name of the agent. Okay, time's up. This is a very classic looking parasite of horses. Nothing else looks like it in any other species. Got one pointed end, which is often embedded in the mucosa. It's flat. It has a, uh, a flat posterior end. This is Anaplocephala perfoliata, a common tapeworm parasite of horses, which generally implants at the ileocecal junction. And everybody wants to blame this for a lot of pathology in the area, including cecal inversions and intersusceptions and, and things like that. Uh, horses tend to uh, manage them. They tend to live with them very well. I don't know how much pathology they actually cause. Occasionally they could probably implant very aggressively and maybe even perforate, but you see them a lot and usually unassociated with any type of pathology. So, so Anaplocephala perfoliata. There's another related parasite that lives a little uh, higher up in the small intestine, Anaplocephala magna, but it doesn't look like this one. It looks like your regular old tapeworm. Okay, slide number two is tissue from a pig. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time is up. We have a classic lesion here. We have total loss of the turbinate bones here. We have loss over here. The septum is deviated. Okay, if you looked at the, the nose of this pig, it'd probably be wrinkled to the side or wrinkled upwards. You'd be able to pick it out from uh, a herd of pigs. And this is a classic disease known as atrophic rhinitis. That's not the morphologic diagnosis. That is the name of the disease. Okay, the disease is caused in pigs by a combination of Bordetella bronchoseptica and Pasteurella multosida type D, especially the toxins that those two agents produce. Now, it may be that Bordetella, which is a common commensal, sort of sets up the uh, disease allowing Pasteurella to flourish. There are actually two types of atrophic. There's, there's the non-progressive, which is fairly mild, and it's just Bordetella bronchoseptica by itself. And then you have the progressive, which is the one where you get these really great lesions, and that's the one there's, that you have superimposed Pasteurella multosida type D is producing toxins, toxins. And the morphologic diagnosis will tell you the story. This is a diffuse turbinate osteomyelitis with atrophy. Okay, you have progressive necrosis and loss of the turbinate bones, and then eventually eh, it's atrophy. And you could probably go after it a couple of different ways here. As long as you knew this classic disease, you knew the agents, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a lot of uh, latitude on how you, uh, how you morph it, as long as you just didn't say atrophic rhinitis, because that is the disease name. Um, Bordetella bronchoseptica, uh, especially ser serotype 12, does a very similar disease on its own in rabbits. You can get atrophic rhinitis in rabbits. It's another common commensal in the nose of rabbits. And you will see, if you have the right serotype, that you'll see lesions very similar to this with loss of turbinates over time. Okay, that's a fun one. Slide number three. Oh, that's from an ox. Okay, how about a morphologic diagnosis and a clinical sign? Okay, time's up. Yeah, we are up close and personal here. 
uh, you might not have figured out what you were looking at. Once I give you the answer, they say, oh, yeah, and you'll probably never miss it again. We're looking at the abomasum. The folds of the abomasum are largely effaced. They're extremely thickened, so something's been added here. You have ulcers on top of them. And this is abomasal lymphoma. This is one of the common manifestations of enzootic bovine lymphoma or a retrovirus which causes lymphoma and you see it in a number of other organs, uh, lymph nodes, the uterus, uh, you might see in spinal cord, but, but abomasum is a very common place and these animals often display melina or tarry stools or actually frank hemorrhage in the stool, okay, you're down past the rumen so it's not going to get caught and bound up in the room, and so it's going to pass out. And they often will have will have blood in their stool. They also have hyperproteinemia. They'll lose weight. Uh, if you said hypercalcemia because this animal has uh, lymphoma, I'm going to take that one as well. So a lot of things. But I want you to focus on something that is sort of GI centric that this would cause, and and bloody stools would be a, a really good one. Okay. Let's go on to slide number four. Slide number four is from a piglet. And I would like a morphologic diagnosis, a cause, and name the disease. Okay, time's up. Another Another classic disease of young pigs, not a disease that you often see in old pigs, it's a young pig type of thing. And this is one where the morphologic diagnosis and the name of the disease are actually quite close. Um, if you said that this was a diffuse exudative epidermitis, I'm going to give you full credit. If you said the name of the disease was Epi exudative epidermis, I'll give you full credit for that. If you want to call this greasy pig disease, I'll give you full credit for that one too. But it is known as exudative epidermitis. And there's very little uh, of a dermal reaction here. The disease is caused by Staphylococcus. It's one of those staphs that uh, uh, tend to have exotoxins, which are very uh, damaging to the uh, epidermis. They get the scalded skin appearance. And uh, so you get this loss of the epidermis. Usually seen in pigs, it can be spread by, uh, by biting insects. It often starts in the ears of pigs. This is one of those diseases that uh, starts at the beginning of the pig, around the head and the face of the pig, and moves backwards, even though I'm, I'm showing you the back of the pig here. Nothing else really looks like this. So very superficial lesion. You know, if you... Uh, uh, if the animals are segregated, they may outgrow it, but this is something because it is so contagious among young piglets, you probably will segregate and cull these particular animals. So, greasy pig disease. Staphylococcus not seen a lot in other species. You can see it. It, it causes uh, conjunctivitis in turkeys, and it will is a cause of toxic shock syndrome, so a systemic uh, disease in people can cause very bad side effects. So, Staph Hayekis. Okay, let's go with slide number five. We've got another pig here. And I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay. Time's up. Now, let's look. Most of the pathology is concentrated in the ureter, okay? There's some changes up here in the kidney as well. I don't know how long it was since this kidney was harvested. Some of this might be a bit of autolysis. It looks a little soft, a little discolored. I'll bet there's something going on, but what I really want you to uh, focus on is a necrohemorrhagic and proliferative, it's too big. If you wanna say eosinophilic, I'll bet those are in there as well ureteritis, and there is a nematode parasite that loves this area, um, and this is Stephanurus dentatus. Stephanurus is a, a used to be a very common parasite now that uh, most pigs have been moved off of dirt, 
Um, we don't see it much anymore. The, the production of pigs is much cleaner. But if you're dealing with backyard pigs, you're down the south, uh, you know, sort of hot, warm, wet summers, you may see Stephanurus dentatus, or you might see it in wild pigs. So it lives in here. It lives primarily in the ureter. Sometimes it gets up into the pelvis. Um, the changes that you would assume are going on here, there's probably, and these are assumptions, I'm not going to say it's exactly what's going on here. You probably see some pyelonephritis. You might see, I would say you probably see some hydronephrosis because I would imagine the urine outflow is not good here. So, Stephanurus dentatus, uh, morphologic diagnosis, I would focus on the proliferative and the uh, 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 necrotizing and hemorrhagic nature of these particular. These are big worms and do a tremendous amount of damage. They also will migrate through the tissues before they get to their happy home in the ureters and renal pelvis, and they are one of the causes of uh, fibrosis within the liver, known as milk spots. Now, I'm also going to give credit for another <clears throat> totally different pathogen here. Um, and that's going to be, if you thought of the bacterium, Eubacterium suis. Eubacterium suis is a bacteria of the lower urinary tract of pigs, especially sows. It causes a tremendous amount of damage in the bladder and ascending urinary tract infections. Just absolutely will wreak havoc on the urinary tract. You can get uh, necrohemorrhagic uh, ureteritis with that. It will ascend and become a... Uh, a lesion in the kidney. So if you went with a suppurative or necrosuppurative ureteritis and pyelonephritis due to eubacterium suis, I want you to get full credit to, because um, without opening this up, we're not going to know which these are. Okay, looks like we got a lot of pigs in this quiz, and you ready for one more pig? So I'm going to ask you for a long differential diagnosis, one of the longest ones that uh, you'll have to know. So here we go. Okay. Tissue from a pig or two pigs. Seem rather affectionate. How about a morphologic diagnosis and give me five causes? Five causes? Is that guy crazy? Let's know five causes. Okay. I'm going to give you a full two minutes to rack your brain and see if you can come up with five causes. And I'm gonna do the same thing after I have a, a sip of a cup of coffee. Okay, coffee off always helps. Okay, morphologic diagnosis, multifocal vesicular nasal dermatitis. As long as you get vesicular in there, that's the most important thing. If you just said dermatitis, that's fine. I'm not gonna take off points if you didn't say nasal. Now we gotta come up with five possible causes. Remember, when you get to the vesicular diseases, pigs are the ones that get them all. They get every single one. No other species gets everything. So we're gonna start with the big one, the one that we worry about, the one that's gonna be a huge outbreak, the one where pigs are the magnifying species. They get the lesions, they produce lots of viruses, they spread the viruses. If this viruses can go 30 miles on an aerosol, and that's foot and mouth disease, or aptovirus, porcine aptovirus. Okay, that's our big one. We worry about all the other ones because we think it might be foot and mouth disease. The rest of them don't cause a whole lot of problems. Sometimes you don't see them all that much. Let's go through them. How about the rhabdovirus, porcine rhabdovirus causing vesicular stomatitis affects horses probably. We see more outbreaks in horses in various parts of the country like the, the Southwest, more, most recently, or the southeast, but pigs will get it too. So that's vesicular stomatitis. Oh, I'll show the same signs. You'll see these vesicles, they got vesicular stomatitis, they'll be smacking their lips and drooling. Um, not going to cause a lot of mortality on its own, but we're probably going to call most of these pigs. Okay. How about the next one, vesicular exanthema? That's one's caused by a Khaleesi virus that causes lesions in sea lions and sea life. It's carried by the opali fish, and it's usually, f we don't see it much anymore. Probably hasn't been an outbreak since the 60s or the 70s. Used to see it when they would feed garbage to pigs. And I don't know whether it, it probably got transmitted by feeding, 
you know, uh, or dumping garbage in the ocean too. And then you had pigs that had had this disease. And it tends to uh, get caught up in a particular type of fish, the opali fish, which sea lions really like um, because it gets caught in the tidal pools. It's very easy for them to uh, catch these. And then they will get uh, a very similar Khaleesi virus with blisters, same at Khaleesi virus, actually with blisters on their flippers. And this was known as San Miguel sea lion virus, because I guess the first time it was identified was in San Miguel. Okay, so I think we've got three. Swine vesicular disease. That wasn't, wasn't, the person who I named that one wasn't terribly creative. It's swine, it's a vesicular disease. Swine vesicular disease is a picorna virus. Okay, so that's, that's one we haven't seen in a long time in this country either. And then finally, the most recent one is one that's been published in the Journal of Veterinary Diagnostic and Investigation, I think in, in Bet Path within the last five or six years. And it's one that just sort of popped up and I'm not exactly sure. It seems to pop up in odd places. And once again, everybody gets excited because this could be uh, foot and mouth disease, which really foot and mouth disease is tremendous economic losses. Not because it kills a lot of animals, but if you see what it does with, with cattle and they won't eat and they won't walk and, you know, the feed conversion is very poor and they, they, the milk falls off. So not every disease, um, you have low morbidity diseases that can cause tremendous economic losses. But let's get away from that. I, you're, I know you're waiting for the name of this, uh, this new virus, and this is Seneca Valley virus, or SVV, and that's the last one. That's number five. That's the one that you need to know. And I'm going to let you look that one up because you can Google it, and there's a lot of articles because it's a fairly recent development on the vesicular disease scene. Okay, if I had enough of vesicular diseases, I want to go on to a species I know a little bit more about, uh, and th here it is. It's the dog. Yes, I grew up in the city. I was a city boy uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I don't think I, uh, I touched my first horse until I got to veterinary school, and I thought that uh, every animal with horns was called a cow. So uh, I had a long learning curve uh, when I got to veterinary school. But I did work a lot with dogs and cats and some exotics in various urban practices in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, so we're back to dogs, and this... I would like a morphologic diagnosis, and I want you to give me a likely breed. Okay, time's up. This is a great picture. Not exactly sure who took this one. Might have been Paul Stromberg, my good buddy Paul Stromberg, who has given me so many great images over the years. But when you look at this, this one was taken underwater because you can see this is a small intestine, and all the villi are outlined by this whitish they're all whitish and they're sort of flowing in the current there it's a beautiful picture of a disease that is called lymphangiectasia uh morphologic diagnosis i shouldn't have asked that that's not an easy thing uh how about a, a diffuse biller lacteal dilation with chyle okay what you say oh, and i should also say on the back end of that and granulomatous lymphangitis. Okay, so that's exactly what you see. On this side, all of the lacteals are very dilated. They have a lot of, of uh, so whitish material within them, chyle. Um, when you flip it over, um, the lymphatics are extremely dilated and you often have multifocal granulomas along the lymphatics. You'll see them in the draining lymph nodes uh, with granulomatous inflammation there. And this is a condition that has been seen in a number of cases with, uh, with a profound breed predilection. Uh, the, let's see, the Norwegian Lundihund is a good one, the Yorkshire Terrier, and the, so the soft-coated Wheaton Terrier are all uh, breeds that have been identified with uh, a predisposition for developing this disease spontaneously. You can also see it if there is lymphatic obstruction. As you can imagine, it's going to back up. So um, you may see it with cancer affecting or lymphoma affecting the lymphatics. 
um, or maybe a large carcinoma that's blocking regional lymphatic drainage. Everything's going to back up. And then, then uh, finally, we used to see this a lot with animals that were fed extremely high caloric diets. Military working dogs used to have this thing called maximum stress diet. And they would feed them this. It was really high fat. It was like 4,000 calories per day, about the same that they were given human soldiers. And a lot of these animals would develop this. They would develop really loose stools. Um, the classic lymphangiectasia, um, because of the backup, they will have marked hypoproteinemia as well, um, and they just lose, lose condition very quickly. So lymphangiectasia, a great disease in the dog. Well, we only have three more uh, images. <clears throat> and this one is from a pig. Having a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. Now, if you're not sure what you're looking at, you're looking at the palatine tonsil. Maybe it's the palatine tonsil. Very pronounced in, uh, in pigs. Here's the, the grooves of the hard palate. We're on the soft palate. It covers the soft palate. Okay, they don't have the cryptal uh, tonsils like, like we do. Okay, then you have larynx back here, and we have these areas here sort of projecting from the crypts of the tonsil. These areas are necrosis, so this is multifocal tonsillar necrosis. And there are a couple things that actually can do this, but the one that you want to think about is porcine pestivirus, the agent of classical swine fever, or as I learned it, hog cholera. And that is one that's very timely right now because we are going through one of the largest outbreaks ever for hog cholera in the world. Significant mortalities in Eastern Europe and China right now. So that's a good one. A couple of other things that will cause necrosis in the tonsils. Um, strep, strep suis will get in there. That is one that you can see that could cause this. Um, pseudorabies, not very common. Uh, porcine uh, herpes virus type 1. Uh, pigs are the reservoir for pseudorabies. And uh, the last one, very rarely, various types of salmonella, the host adapted ones, may cause tonsillar necrosis. But when I see this, I'm hopefully immediately going to start thinking about classical swine fever, hog cholera, and I'll get on the phone to some of the authorities. Okay, next slide. I'm gonna be incredibly mean on this one. I've been so nice to you with all the rest of them. So I'm gonna be mean and I'm not gonna give you species because that's part of the question. I would like species. I would like an associated morphologic diagnosis and name the disease. Okay, I hope I told you. Did I tell you? There's tissue from a cat. Okay, time's up. We have a cat brain. Everything looks pretty good because the lesion is outside of the frame of view. Well, that's mean. Okay, but all you need to see is this little fella right here. The agent, this is a maggot. The fly that it comes from is Cuterebra emasculator. Seen in the uh, United States. Usually the disease shows up late summer, early fall. And what happens is the Cuterebra fly will lay the egg on the nose of a cat. Maybe the cat has a cat scratch on its nose, a little bit of wound or something's attracted it and the, it will lay eggs, they will hatch, and the eggs go up the nasal cavity through the cribriform plate and go into and around the brain. What a terrible thing. And it's not sure whether it is the migration of the parasite itself or some type of chemicals that it liberates, maybe some of the spines it leaves behind, um, but this is a trigger for damage and spasm of the middle cerebral arteries, and so you end up with infarction in the drainage areas along the the lateral edges of the cerebrum in the middle of the brain 
But the disease is called ischemic encephalopathy. I'm not sure whether it's just a spasm or it's thrombosis or whatever, but that uh, initially you have hemorrhage and then over time it will sort of collapse on itself and become a shell. It can be unilateral and these animals will circle to that side. It could be bilateral and they don't know uh, which side to circle. Um, but it does, it's a very devastating neurologic disease in affected animals. And if you see it and you're very careful, you go in there and you will find the little maggot or maggot remnants. If it's a chronic case and they tried to nurse this cat along, you'll find remnants of this cuterebra larva within the cranium. So be very particular when you are uh, uh, necropsying neurologic cats and maybe sometime in your career you will be rewarded by one of these little fellows. Okay, it is our last slide before Christmas. So let's do well. This is tissue from a sheep. I would like a morphologic diagnosis and a cause. Okay, time's up. We're looking at Here's the teeth. We're looking at the sinuses of a sheep. Not a whole lot of stuff happens in the sinuses of a sheep. But if you see any type of growth, um, sometimes you'll see, you know, larva of estrus ovis. There's not a lot. But the other thing is usually you'll see these growths in the nasal cavities or the sinuses of uh, sheep and goats. And it can be hemorrhagic. It could be just very nice and cellular and white here. Anything that's growing back here, you probably at the top of your list should be enzootic nasal carcinoma. The morphologic diagnosis is simply nasal carcinoma. It is enzo the disease is enzootic nasal carcinoma, and it is caused by a what used to be type D is now a beta retrovirus. Remember that uh, two species. One is sheep, they have like 19 or 22 retroviruses within their genome. Mice have even more, so they're just waiting for the right couple of hits to, or genetic mutations to turn on these tumors and they'll start growing. And so this is a big one in sheep. Another one that they get is pulmonary carcinoma or Yagsicti, which is also an endogenous retrovirus. The interesting thing about this one, Yagsicti is endogenous, you know, it's not usually spread that much. This one is enzootic, which means it's probably also spread by horizontal transmission. And so, uh, but anything that you see growing in the nasal cavity of a sheep, I want you immediately to go to this enzootic nasal carcinoma. If it's something else, very rare, I'm sure they get spontaneous lesions. Could this be lymphoma? I suppose it could, but in this area, we're going to have uh, one, two, and three is going to be a retroviral induced tumor. Okay, well, the test is over. Our last test before the holiday season. Wherever you're watching this, I wish you the happy and yours, the happiest of holidays. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever you celebrate. I hope it's wonderful for you, for your family, for your colleagues and friends. And I look forward to giving you more gross path challenges in the new year. Take care, everybody.